Right. So uh, you remember that in the very first class, which was a kind of exploratory uh, class, we said that uh, international uh, that international law, uh, international politics, interstate relations, whatever, diplomacy in general, could be approached in, in different ways. And I think I started out by saying that there was a descriptive way, and I gave um, some examples of that, that is that essentially you, you do it to Kissinger way, the, the, the big book of, of Kissinger, you kind of tell the story of international relations. That's the descriptive way. Then I said there is the normative approach, that is uh, the approach essentially through uh, law and ethics, because law and ethics play, of course, a very important role in the conduct of nations. And I mentioned that again because today we, were, we are very strongly uh, going uh, to go on the part, the normative part, because we are going to talk about conflict and war. Uh, then we had what we called the conceptual approach, conceptual analytical approach. That is where you don't look really at the facts and events as they succeed through history. Uh, neither do you look at what ought to be done instead of what has been done. That's the normative approach. But you kind of bring concepts to the fore, which give you the tools and instruments to conceptualize a certain problem, certain international uh, datum. And uh, finally, there was the, what I call the practical approach that was essentially the answer to the question, uh, what is diplomacy? Diplomacy is simply what a diplomat does. What is medicine? Medicine is what a doc does. And the practical approach, that will be the one for the last two sessions, we will bear on what a diplomat does in daily life. First and foremost, he negotiates, then he talks in public, then he prepares speeches for his minister, speech writing, he drafts resolutions in the Security Council, but he also drafts perhaps a kind of declaration of principles, whatever. So you have essentially negotiation, speaking in public, writing speeches, drafting resolutions and that kind of things, and also interaction with the press, which increasingly, of course, is becoming very important, but particularly with an assertive press, uh, particularly the US press, which is, and the UK press, just look at BBC interviews. These are very assertive undertakings, uh, contrary to press in, in many other countries, I would say, uh, where, uh, where you can, well, an interview is more like a chat than uh, grilling the people. But, um, so the practical thing is for next week, the practical, also called sometimes pragmatic diplomacy. The conceptual one was the kind of conflict cycle that we did last week, because basically we went through that cycle through concept, preventive diplomacy, post-conflict peace building and that kind of things. It was a kind of conceptual tour of the cycle of conflict. Uh, the, f the descriptive one, that was basically the third lecture uh, that I gave you when we kind of tried to detect the underlying elements which, which determine the, the policies as we know it. We said, let's look at the world as if it were at a distant place and let's kind of approach it. And that was a kind of storytelling. What's, what's happening with this world? We see Trump going up, we see Madame Le Pen making statements and so that was a descriptive uh, approach. And now we are at the normative for today. And as I already said to you, why are we at the normative? Because the questions of war and peace, the questions of security and peace, and in the very first lesson I told you that that is really the core of diplomacy, that is what diplomacy circles around, peace and security, war and peace. These questions, of course, are very much dictated by a normative set of rules. And therefore, today, more than ever, we will be close to international law. 
That is why last week I could tell you that this segment, which was the war segment, is being governed essentially by two sources of law. Law in Latin is used and international lawyers continue to use quite a lot of Latin uh, phraseology. And you have the use at ballum and the use in ballo. The right to go to war, or to put it somewhat more simple, the right to threaten or use the f force, that is the right to act uh, with, um, with, with military means, at the right to the war, the right in the war, and the right in the war, the law in the war, use, is in fact the whole set of rules and norms that dictate the way you, you conduct your, the war. It's the rules of conduct in war. What can you do, what can't you do? It's not the, pre, uh, the pre preamble, the, the, the question before that, do I have a right to engage in war? It's once that question is being settled, once I am in a war, what can I do and what can't I do? On this I won't say a lot, but just to give you a feel of what this is about, this is, for instance, about what kind of weaponry you can use. Cluster bombs, for instance, are definitely not allowed to be used under any circumstances. Chemical, biochemical, nuclear weapons are not to be used in any way. But it's also about the treatment of prisoners of war. It's also about how a soldier, somebody who is an official warrior, if I may say so, has to be dressed. A warrior has to wear a uniform. That is one of the reasons why when Putin sent in his ununiformed men in Ukraine and Crimea, why he got quite a lot of reproaches, because this is the infringement of a rather basic law of war. You don't do that. Any soldier has to have a clear identification of to what army he belongs and what number, what his identity is. Within the Jus in Bello, the law that stands in the conduct of war, you have also very explicit rules that uh, tell you what you can do with the civilian population. That is the population that is not part of the enemy army. And in particular, you have protective rules as regards children and women. Okay, this I just give you a few examples of what it is about. Uh, just f for being complete, uh, we very often refer to all these laws as the laws of The Hague uh, and the laws of Geneva. Because most conventions, these have been set in international agreements, most conventions containing these laws have been uh, negotiated and signed and finally uh, ratified after ratification in different capitals in The Hague in the first place, in the very beginning of the 19th century, uh, 20th century, and then Geneva much later, <laughs> after, including after the uh, Second World War. So uh, on this we won't talk, speak much. On this, uh, on the other hand, we, say, we will say a lot, because this, of course, as you understand, uh, somehow the conduct in war, okay. You have rules, you respect them, and so on. But politically, this is much more important. That is, did you, were you entitled to go to war? And here the politics and the legality are very close together. Your entitlement, your political entitlement to go to war, and we will contrast the two wars of Father Bush and Son Bush, the first Gulf War, the second Gulf War, 
the entitlement to go to war is very much linked to whether you fall within the norm or not, the international law norm or not. And that gives me the, the possibility to tell you something about international law. Uh, I don't know whether there are lawyers here in the room, but I want to make something quite clear to you. That is that international law is very, very different from what we call national law, domestic law. Domestic law, that is what the parliament has adopted, what the decrees of regions and communities uh, are being adopted. And that's a rather well-defined set of rules. Uh, for which you can go to the court in order to make sure that these rules are being respected and that kind of things. Uh, you have different systems of law, you have the common law in the Anglo-Saxon countries such as the UK and the US, you have the common law system which is the system particularly for the continent of Europe, the so-called Code Napoleon of 1804 is one of the basic building blocks of our continental law and that law has been exported all over the place, particularly in Latin America, but also in African countries and for instance the South African uh, Code, uh, yes, the South African legal system is very close to ours as well as ours goes back to the Roman law. But, that's not the point right now. My point right now is domestic national law is a well-defined body of norms and you can always appeal to courts so that the law is being respected by whomever that be. International law is quite different as it to its very nature. It's still law, that is, it has a normative force, but for most uh, practical purposes, although theoretically you can go to the, a court such as, for instance, the International Court of Justice uh, who has its seat in The Hague, you may know that most judicial, international judicial um, instances, entities, uh, have their seat in The Hague that started in the old times of the League of Nations, which was the precursor of the United Nations. It started with the Court of Arbitration, and then after the UN was being uh, signed uh, the Charter in San Francisco, we had an international court of law. But you have also the International Criminal Court, the ICC, of which you certainly heard. The ICC is not a civil court, it's a criminal court for criminal offences and that is where uh, such people as Jean-Pierre Bemba, for instance, from Congo has been uh, treated, uh, Milosevic has gone through it and other uh, such kind of people who have done not just infringement on international law but specifically infringements on what we call international crimes and war crimes. War crimes are exactly the crimes I was uh, telling you about. These are crimes against the international law in the war, what we call humanitarian law. Formerly that was called the law of war. Law of war, now we call it humanitarian law. Now this time we are here and that is the law that regulates your entitlement to go to war. That is the use ad bellum. And um, there's a lot to be said about that. Uh, there was a clear tendency after the First World War to kind of banish wa war at all. Simply say war is going to be banished forever we never will indulge in a war anymore. And there, was, there were different attempts in that direction. One of the most known, well-known attempt is the so-called kellogg bryant Pact from 1928. I mention that specifically because that was quite a significant um, um, agreement. Kellogg was the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the US and Briand, Bryant, uh, the French one, 
28, they came together, they had an international conference, an international agreement, and their law is being outlawed. So the principle that law is and cannot be legal in any way was kind of established, but there was a little text or a little article that followed and that said, except for self-defense. And that is very important because this is the kind of mindset that we still have today. War can only be permitted, allowed, uh, accepted when it is for reasons of self-defense. Now, uh, before I go further about the legality of war, I also want to add at this stage that there will be a little second chapter, not on the legality, but the legitimacy. That is to say, even when you have a legal entitlement to go to war, for instance, out of self-defense, then still there is a second question you should ask, even though it's legal, is it legitimate? And legitimate is, in fact, a kind of sophisticated, sophisticated way to ask the question, does it make sense? But I'll come back to that. Now, for the legality, uh, there aren't a lot of treaties or charters or whatever that tell you exactly what can and cannot be done in terms of being allowed to go to war. It's more a doctrine. And that br brings me back to the nature of international law. International law is, in fact, something like rules of behavior. And the difference between is it now a norm that constrains me to do something, or is it something that the community of international states would have accepted anyway is very small. So it's not like I have to force people to do that. Most of those rules would be respected anyway. And that is what we call customary law. Now, the bulk of the important, well, the bulk of international law is customary international law. And that word says something of itself. It's a custom. We just follow a custom. Now, what's the difference? Where is the constraint? Because legality and norms, normally there is a constraint, there is a normative prescriptive element in the law. But the custom, well, no, there is not much prescriptive in it because it's customary. You should do it or you do it as a matter of custom anyway. And I want to stress that just for you to understand very well the very nature of international law. International law in a certain sense much less prescriptive than domestic law because what it says is something that I would say a wise man or a civilized people would do anyway. And that is what we call customary law. And now what I'm going to tell about your entitlement to go to war is essentially that kind of law. It's rules which to some extent have been taken up in some international agreements or accords or what have you, such as the uh, Charter of the United Nations, but also somehow you just read about that in what we call doctrine, the doctrine, uh, which are, you know, professors of law, uh, seminars on international law, conferences where you have certain conclusions which are not legally binding, but where you have conclusions which have a force on their, of their own. And that is what we call customary law. Now, one of the uh, important principles, as I told you, is that the use of force is allowed in cases of self-defense. That is undisputed. That is to say, when you have been attacked in one way or another, you have the right to defend yourself. And of course, in principle, you will do that unilaterally, and there is no problem there whatsoever. So, there is a threat, 
the threat had been executed on you, you defend yourself, no problem, you can do it. The only thing that the Charter prescribes is that as soon as you enter into acts of war, you have to notify that to the Security Council in New York. The Security Council then takes up the matter and decides for itself what should be done. It can tell you, calm down, there you're exaggerating a little bit, it can also tell or ask other countries to join you in your self-defense. All right? Also, uh, be aware about the fact that when we speak about self-defense, this is not just something that one country can do for itself to protect itself against an external threat. It is also something that a collectivity of states can do. E.g., for instance, a defense organization. Now, you're all familiar with one of the most prominent, if not unique at this stage, defense organizations in the world, which is, of course, the defense organization here in Brussels called North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. That is a defense organization. That is not a security organization. The UN is a security organization. The OSE is a security organization. Security is just a broader term. Defense means I only can act in the defense of either myself or the community of countries, member states, of the organization, such as NATO. NATO can never do an offensive act. NATO could never, never say, we now collectively decide to declare a war towards whatever, North Korea. But it can defend its members. All right, there we are. I will say something on the United States and North Korea in, in one minute. So that's what we call the reactive self-defense. All right, a reactive. Now, when there is a threat, the question then is, do I really have to ask until that enemy with whom I have an ongoing dispute, you remember the distinction we made between dispute, conflict, and now to some extent, one modality of conflict is war. Do I have to just wait and sit until that guy who is provoking me, who is intimidating me and what have you, uh, actually comes onto my territory or otherwise attacks my sovereignty? There, international, again, customary law, the doctrine, the law professors make a distinction between a preemptive, preemptive, and a preventive self-defense action. When a threat is imminent, then you are entitled to preemptively neutralize your enemy. That means that you do not have again to go first to the Security Council and ask for an authorization. The normal rule is you have to go to the Security Council and ask for an authorization. You don't have to do that when you have been attacked. Because then, of course, you can self-defend yourself, but you have to notify the Security Council. Now, there is a threat, that's the preemptive case, and the threat is imminent. They also use the word proximate. You may recall that in the first very lesson that I gave here four weeks ago or six weeks ago, so five weeks ago, uh, I gave you, I, I brought some uh, articles from the Financial Times and I drew your attention to a statement made by the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Japan and the Minister of Defense, sorry, of Japan. And the Japanese Minister of Defense, in relation to the North Korean 
threat had spoken about an imminent threat. And I told you at that time, this is not just a word used among other possible words. He could have said um, an, a serious threat or a threat that uh, is uh, upsetting the balance of you know, power in the region. He could have circumscribed that differently. But he used the word imminent. And I told you, he did that on purpose. This was not just a word that came up in his mind. Hafazartli, it was something that was well calculated, perhaps not by the minister, but perhaps by one of his councillors who knew what the law on war exactly is. And he spoke about an imminent threat. When you have an imminent threat, you can strike preemptively your enemy without first waiting for the Security Council to take a decision. But again, as when you are in the reactive case, you have, as soon as you have preemptively made a strike, you have to um, notify the Security Council. The North Korean case today is rather interesting from that perspective. Because when Kim Jong-un made the statement that he has the intention, not just that he might, but that he has the intention to strike the territory of the United States of America with, with one of his ballistic missiles, which he's now working out. He's working on two, uh, on two elements. He's working on the missile site, what we call the delivery uh, machinery, He's working on the nuclear warhead, which is, of course, the nuclear device. That is what non-proliferation is about. So he threatened, he actually threatened the United States with sending them a ballistic missile uh, somewhere on the Western Territory, California, you name it. This, you could, you could have made the case that this is an imminent threat. And that is why Trump reacted with his fire and fury. You may recall that he said, we will strike back with fire and fury. As a matter of fact, he could even perhaps, perhaps, have said, let's go for a preemptive strike. And preemptively strike is really neutralize a threat before it realizes itself. Now, of course, since a lot in that interchange between Kim Jong-in and Mr. Uh, Trump was kind of megaphone diplomacy, as we call it. A lot of noise, but not much substance. Uh, fortunately, uh, both kind of understood that this was big mouth politics, but not really a real threat, uh, because most probably Kim Jong-un would understand that if he would touch with one single ballistic missile, one single little place in the United States, that next day he may forget the entire country called North Korea. Uh, but just to show you a little bit how the vocabulary works and how uh, that is... Uh, now, as I told you, preventive law is a preventive action armed action is something different. That is when a threat is building up short of being imminent, short of being proximate. It's what we call a latent threat. The threat is there. And the threat is indeed a very important one, an existential one, that is, should the threat be realized, it could destroy my country or at least parts of the country. So the threat is serious, but it is not imminent. It is not something that is going to happen within the next few days because somebody may push on a button or something like that. That is what they call preventive action. You want not to preempt a threat, you want to prevent that the threat realizes itself. This is unlawful. Such preventive action 
is unlawful and uh, whenever you feel like threatened, but not by an imminent threat, but by a latent threat, you simply go to the Security Council and say, look, this is my file, this is my dossier, have a look at it, I feel really threatened and I want you to take action. And then the Security Council will see whether or not something has to be done. It is very possible that they say, yes, this is a latent threat and we are going to act. E.g., for instance, in the first stage, with sanctions, what we call a sanction regime. We set up a sanction regime with asset freeze, with boycotts as far as trade is concerned. Parties may be ejected of certain uh, organizations and that kind of things. Or they can go a step further and say, look, not only are we going to issue a sanction regime, uh, we allow you, the country, or allow the collection of countries, which can be an organization a la NATO, but it can also be not a formal organization, it can be a coalition of states, and you all are familiar with the label the coalition of the able and willing, because most fighting uh, in this world, legitimate fighting, legal fighting, uh, happens through, as you know, coalitions of countries. The coalitions, as we call it, of the able and willing. Able means, do we have the capacities to uh, support that war? And willing is, of course, do we have the political will to enter that course? Um, so, for instance, and now we give the example of the two Gulf Wars. The first Gulf War was supported by a very broad coalition, including smaller countries like Belgium. We were particularly active in uh, demining and maritime sector. Then you had those who were in the field, that is, in the desert, uh, in between Kuwait and Baghdad. Uh, that was a totally legitimate action where the Security Council uh, had been informed at once after uh, the uh, Iraqi had invaded uh, Kuwait. The other Gulf War, the one of the sun, was quite different, as you recall, some of you may recall, 2003, very difficult discussions in the Security Council, which did not result in a resolution proper. And therefore, the dominant, the dominant reading of that war is that it was not legal, and therefore a fortiori not legitimate. But I come back to that. Um, of course, the US, the UK, Portugal, those countries who participated in that second war uh, did claim that it was legal on the basis not of the non-existent new resolution that was never voted in the first place, but on the basis of prior resolutions where you could see in between the lines that there was kind of a threat of the use of force. So that is reactive, preemptive, preventive. Now, these are what you could call a kind of external threats. There is an external threat coming to me, and then either alone or with the collectivity, I react to that external threat. There are also threats that are not external per se, but that are located within a country and the threat is not towards another country, it's just a country that just by itself, because of endogenic warfare, civil war, genocide, think about Rwanda, uh, and that kind of things. A lot of civil wars, as you remember, uh, once uh, the, the wall of Berlin fell, we had civil wars all over the place. We had them in Congo, we had them in Angola, we had them in Sri Lanka, we had them in Colombia. Uh, civil wars were all around, but these were 
wars that were confined to within the country, like for instance Angola. So in principle, nobody, I say in principle, should complain about that. They got a serious problem over there, and that's not my thing. That's not the dominant reading of such a crisis. The dominant reading is, even though such a crisis is internal to another state, still this can spill over and upsets the regional equilibrium and balance in the region we are talking about. For instance, the Central African region, which was, which is true. The, at a certain moment, the civil unrest was not an open war, but the civil unrest with a lot of militia go, militias going on in Congo was of such a nature that seven neighboring countries were involved. Now, there are only seven neighboring countries. You have Congo Brazzaville, you have Uganda, you have Rwanda, you have Burundi, you have, I think, a, a short stretch of Tanzania, you have Zambia, and you have Angola. Almost all of these countries were somehow affected by that war within Congo. And that is why we say that even domestic conflicts may be a matter of international peace and security. And I think I already said that once, as soon as something is a matter of international peace and security, then the Security Council has jurisdiction. It's competent. Now, why do I stress that kind of distinction between an external threat and a kind of domestic event? The reason I do that is because in the same charter of the United States, you have a famous article, we already met one article, 51. This you have to keep in mind. Article 51 is a self-defense clause. Fundamental in everything which is warfare. But you have here another, well, the Charter is an exceptionally readable document, very well drafted. And you should read uh, the little introduction. We, the peoples of the United Nations, determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. Just a little anecdote. This was a little young intern diplomat with a delegation in San Francisco, with a US delegation who told those wise, old-style diplomats, you have drafted a fantastic charter, congratulations, but shouldn't we put something like an appeal to humanity at large, drafted almost in a childish language, you should read that when you go home, a childish, it's talking about women and nations and person, equal rights of women, the established condition of justice and respect for obligations, very easy language, and she was, she was a, a young girl of something like 23 years, all among those guys in San Francisco, and she drafted that on a little paper. She taught it to the US delegation, they said fantastic, and so it became uh, the introduction to the uh, charter. But now I'm going to read you Article 2.7, Article 2 and then Paragraph 7. And that says, the organization shall ensure that states which are, uh, sorry, seven, eh? nothing contained in the present charter, nothing, shall authorize the United Nations to intervene in matters which are essentially within the domestic, uh, domestic jurisdiction of any state or shall require the members to submit such matters to settlement. But the point is, nothing in this charter authorizes the United Nations, and that is of course also all its member states, to intervene in matters which are essentially within the domestic jurisdiction of any state. Domestic jurisdiction is a legal term which means under the lawful control of the country. So here you have what we call the principle of non-intervention, or also called the principle of non-interference with domestic affairs of another country. So, when you read this literally, 
and there is a conflict out there in the country, normally you cannot do anything. Unless that country asks, of course, of your help. But normally you can't do anything. However, a couple of exceptions. And that is exactly where the upsetting of international peace and security comes in. I told you, whenever a domestic uh, thing may potentially upset international peace and security, then yes, we can put our finger in the country. And there, generally, it is accepted that that can only be done when, first, there is mass, there are mass atrocities from the type genocide, ethnic cleansing, then you can intervene. So in Rwanda, for instance, we should have intervened in a much stronger way because, as a matter of fact, we went away with the UN mission, but I, I won't go into details because it's a rather complicated thing. Genocide, ethnic cleansing, as we saw to some extent in the Balkans, but as we see today in Myanmar, just to tell you that these things are not very abstract. The very, this very day that we speak with uh, each other, there is ethnic cleansing going on. In those cases, the United Nations and its members are entitled to intervene in the conflict and try to stop it. The same is also true when there are uh, war crimes that have been committed or big infringements against humanitarian law. But we leave that at that. So in that case, intervention is possible and uh, the Security Council can, of course, act uh, accordingly. So what you see is that the principle of non-interference, non-intervention, is not a principle that gives a state the immunity of doing whatever you wish. That is over. At the old reading in the 19th century, the principle of non-intervention, and the, which is the kind of negative way of expressing something positively, which is the principle of independent sovereignty, or sovereign independence, whomever you want to phrase it. Each country has sovereignty and independence. And it is because of that principle that there is no interference. So this, the two are, the, in fact, the two sides of the same coin. Now, uh, as I told you, there are limitations to that. And this, the principle of non-interference, your, your right of sovereignty is not that you get a kind of immunity and that you can do whatever you wish. That is not the case. It simply means that you, have, you can act on yourself to the extent you do so responsibly. I already told you that uh, self-defense and going to war uh, can be carried out by one state unilaterally, uh, also by a coalition of states, also by an organization. Just for your information, an organization can never, ever enter into war without passing first to the Security Council. So, contrary to a state that may at once react to a threat and at once preemptively, preemptively strike another country and then only go to the Security Council, an organization, organization such as NATO, defense organization, or security organization like the OSCE, need preliminary agreement of the uh, Security Council. So, that is for the legality. Uh, a word on legitimacy, because as I told you, uh, it is not just whether force can be legally used, but primarily it is a question as a matter of good conscience and good sense, uh, should we go to war? In other terms, even when you have a legal entitlement to go to war, individually or collectively, you still have to ask the question, is it legitimate? It's legal, I know it, but is it legitimate? This is a kind of question about the opportunity, but the kind of opportunity 
not legal opportunity, but the kind of moral opportunity, the kind of also political opportunity. Does it politically make sense that I go to war? Yes, I have been attacked, but now going to war may perhaps exacerbate the situation. Perhaps this was a mistake or a mishandling by the other country, not really meant to damage myself and that kind of things. And in that respect, um, sometimes we call that rules of prudence. Not prudence in terms of let's be prudent, but prudence in terms of wisdom. Prudence comes from a Latin word prudentia, and prudentia doesn't mean I kind of am scary and I don't dare do it. Prudentia means wisdom. Just refer to your wisdom. And the rules are basically five, and there is again quite a large consensus on those five, you know, checks that you have to do for the legitimacy. So you tick them off, one after another even though you have a Security Council authorization, for instance. The first is uh, seriousness of threat. Is the threat clear and serious? You know, you can, there have been sometimes in Latin America, in the history of Latin America, there have been some wars where really one was wondering whether these were real wars. Uh, I remember vaguely, I should have to look that up, uh, but when I lived for the first time in Washington, that was 94, 98, Clinton administration, there was a kind of obscure little war between Ecuador and Peru uh, in an obscure forest where apparently nobody ever had set any food and were obscurely, apparently, something like six to ten meters had been not occupied, but, you know, there were military people who had entered beyond the official border, something like ten meters, and some shots were shot. And the question was then, um, is this war? Uh, is this an act of aggression which gives me the legitimacy to self-defend myself without asking the Security Council for an authorization? So here comes the rule of prudence. Yes, your sovereignty had been infringed, even though it was only 10 meters, even though these were only 10 military over the other side who came into that wood uh, forest. But then the question is, is this a serious threat? Most probably you would say it's not a serious threat. So clear, serious and proper kind uh, of threat. That's the first uh, prudence rule. Check the seriousness of threat. Second uh, prudence rule is the proper purpose. Uh, does my reaction, does my action in defense of my territory or whatever, have a proper purpose? Which proper, pur proper again is, is it legitimate? Is it a legitimate purpose? That is, is the purpose indeed primarily to halt or avert the threat? Is that my purpose? I want to halt or avert the threat. You could as well kind of intervene because you want to give a good slap to your enemy or you will want to get a lot of publicity in the newspapers or the CNN channels all around the world. That's not the proper purpose. In that case, your, the criterion of proper purpose has not been fulfilled. Proper purpose means the purpose of your reacting is indeed to halt the threat. And it's not to give a lot of publicity because you don't like that other guy anyway, which is an improper objective. Third, that's a classical one, that's last resort. Did I exhaust all other avenues to solve that problem? There is a threat, 
the threat has perhaps been executed to some extent, did I explore all other means to avert the threat? That is, for instance, did I set at once my ambassador to speak with the authorities of the country and say, what is this? What happens there? And they give some explanations and that kind of things. Um, or perhaps I've called for other countries to come in, to mediate, to make sure that the other guy calms down, to better understand what was the cause or the reason of his intervention. And only when I have checked all those peaceful means to settle the dispute or the conflict, and nothing works, the guy, the other one, continues to make problems, then I have exhausted all remedies, as we call that, and I have the only last resort for me is indeed to react militarily. The fourth prudence rule is the rule of proportionality. That is, you act only to the extent and in proportion that the other attacked you. You should not go further than the attack you got. You got one attack, you give one attack back. But not one attack of your enemy and a full-fledged war invading the whole of the territory of the other one. But it's also proportionality is also a rule, not so much at, but in bellow, that is, don't exaggerate, basically. That's, that's the rule. Don't exaggerate. Keep it proportional uh, in terms of scale, duration, intensity. The intensity, all that, sc the scale of your operation, the duration of your operation, the intensity of operation should be the minimum necessary. And finally, uh, there is the last prudence rule that is the balance of consequences. And that is essentially the following question that you have to ask. Is there a reasonable chance of the military action being successful with consequences of the action not being worse than that of inaction. In other terms, the balance of consequences is if by, if let's say I got an attack on my territory, there were 10 people dead. And now I will uh, counterattack, and in my troops, I lose. 20 people, then the rule of balance of consequences is not being fulfilled. Because by entering into a counterattack, I inflate what my conse the consequences of that are such that they are greater than the attack that I want to counteract was in the first place. Now, these are, just to stress again, not formal rules. Uh, that you have to respect in terms of this is legally binding and that kind of things. But th these are prudence, rules of prudence, rules of legitimacy that are very important in judging the political wisdom of, uh, of warfare, of conducting of war. And in that uh, respect, I would like to introduce another distinction uh, which are the distinction between a war of necessity, necessity and a war of choice. This is a rather classical uh, distinction. A war of necessity, and you, see, you will see that comes close to the prudence rules I gave, and to the legality rules as well. It's kind of wrap up of all the rules that somehow govern uh, your entitlement to act uh, militarily. A war of necessity is one where, as the word says, where there are good grounds, strong grounds for you to act militarily, because it's necessary. And again, the Kuwait War, the First World War, is generally considered 
a war of necessity. And it is because it was a war of necessity that you easily got the authorization by the Security Council and that Mr. Bush's father could set up that big coalition which, when my recollection is right, was among 50 up to 60 countries. A coalition of up to 50, 60 countries, you can easily understand that that gives you a lot of legitimacy. But in the first place, what every, un, everybody understood, this was a, a war of necessity. And why was it a war of necessity? Because, of course, the invasion by Saddam Hussein of little brother Kuwait without any prior notification and so on, just invading the country, uh, taking over the capital, Kuwait City, um, making basically putting the whole country uh, on zero and you take over the control. That was so such clear infringement of the basic rules of behavior. And I, again, I use basic rules of behavior, basic rules of international law. This, this just overlaps customary law, as I told you. Basic rules of behavior like respect for the international borders respect for what we call territorial integrity of the states, non-use of force. I told you the basic rule is non-use of force. The basic exception is uh, self-defense. Uh, All these rules were simply being upset so flagrantly that nobody was disputing that this was a war of necessity that was both legal and legitimate. But then, when we go for a war of choice, things become much more difficult. Now, why do they use the choice? Well, already as you feel, a war of choice is like, I got options here. One of the options was, let's negotiate. The other option is, let's call Gutierrez, Ban Ki-moon, Kofi Annan that he comes in between as a mediator to make things over, or let's do a little war. It's like you have a menu and you can choose and pick whatever suits you best. That's the choice element. And as you feel, in such a choice, there is not that kind of coercion. There is not that kind of necessity that you have in a war necessity, and therefore, such laws are generally considered both not legal and not legitimate. Not legitimate, just check the third rule I gave you, the last resort rule. Clearly, when you have different options, when there is a choice to be made, then the last resort rule, have I, exo have I exhausted all other possibilities to avoid having to use the force was not uh, fulfilled. An example of that war, of course, is um, the second Iraq war in 2003. As you know, the coalition was almost in existence as compared to the 50-60 for, uh, for the first World War, uh, Gulf War. Uh, we ended up with a coalition of something like four or five. I think we went through then the the other day, Portugal, uh, UK, well, US of course, UK, um, you, uh, Portugal, who else was there, perhaps? Poland to Spain. Was Spain in that? Sure. Okay, well, you see, it was a very small uh, coalition, and certainly not like the other one. The wars of choice have also a kind of different motivation. And I will say something on that, and then perhaps we will uh, smoothly uh, phase out. They have a different motivation, and you will easily understand what I mean. The war of necessity is rather easy to understand. Fundamental principles have been broken. We cannot tolerate that, because if we tolerate that, we set precedents for the future. If Saddam can do that with Kuwait, others can do it with other countries, and the kind of rules-based world order collapses, and we end up with total anarchy. 
That's more or less the reading of war of necessity. Therefore, we must act. War of choice is slightly different. War of choice is, look, that guy is not behaving very properly. Uh, should we go for the war option? We could do as well something else, but perhaps let's go for the war option because I also don't like too much that guy. That's what we call regime change. In fact, uh, the, the war, the act of aggression that I do, the use of force that I do, is not to rectify the behavior of the guy because he broke fundamental principles of international law. No, it's because I don't like him. Regime change. Saddam Hussein, clearly, the underlying motivation was regime change. Uh, but also, and that again brings us within the vocabulary of George Bush, George W. Bush, Jr. Export of democracy, export of human rights, and so on. Now, however noble that may seem to export your democratic values, to export your human rights, clearly this cannot justify in any way the use of force. And in the case of George Bush, all this was mingled. And that gave some nobility, some prestige to his action because he said, look, but I'm doing it, I, I'm, I'm doing this for the sake of civilization, humanity. Saddam Hussein is a bastard. He killed so many of his own people, which by the way is true because Saddam Hussein used chemical weapons as well at an earlier time, as did Assad in the more recent past. Um, but that is not enough. That is not enough for a proper legality and legitima legitimacy. Want to get rid of a dictator, bring democracy and human rights to a country, which, if we are serious about it, uh, is not really that successful because the end result of the Iraq war, the second one, is that whereas there was a relative stability under a dictator, we now ended up, as you have witnessed from 2003 to 2000, basically 16, 17 now, that the whole country has been upset and that whereas there was a relative unity and coherence in the country, we now ended up with having that confrontation between the Sunni and the Shia. As you know, Saddam Hussein was a Sunni. The Ba'ath party was essentially a Sunni party. Today the Shia have overtaken and it's all the way around. Uh, whereas the Sunni were oppressed, uh, the, the Shia were oppressed by the Sunni at the time of Saddam Hussein. Now it's slightly the reverse. The Americans and others trying to fix it. But this was the legacy of a war that was not well thought through. It was also, it's also a nice example of a war where the politicians in the capital, in this case Washington, think that military action is enough and the rest will follow, which definitely is not the case. As I said last week, winning the peace is quite often much more difficult than winning the war. Winning the war is a question of victors and victims. We also discussed that last week. Winning a peace is really something that has to trickle down to any single human, child, woman, man, and what have you. We said something on that also, something last week when we spoke about human security. Right, that is what I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, war and peace. Uh, one last word uh, on peacekeeping and that kind of stuff. War and peace, by the way, you should be aware, just to show you how, uh, how central that is to the concerns of a diplomat, uh, until only some decades, most of our countries, including here in West Europe, had a ministry of war. As we had, for instance, in Belgium, a ministry of the colonies, until 
the beginning of the 60s when the decolonization set in as far as the Belgian uh, colonies in Central Africa were concerned, we also had a Ministry of War. Just to show you the reality and proximity of war in international security debates, we often, uh, even today, I go very often to conferences and what have you, and speaking and listening and what, that kind of thing. I can tell you that a recurrent theme is that if there is one single thing that you never should take for granted, it is security. There is no such thing as irreversibility when we speak about war and insecurity. Now, the last thing, as I told you, that I wanted to tell you a little bit, is uh, peacemaking and uh, peacekeeping. I already told you that peacekeeping, in order to keep a peace, there must be peace in the first place. So that ipso facto is post-conflict. Peacemaking, that is, since you have to make the peace, that means the peace is not yet there, so that is pre-conflict. Now, why do I make the distinction? Because in the UN, and for all these matters of security and war and peace, I can tell you chapter 6 and chapter 7 of the Charter are, let's say, what uh, you should read. Chapter 6 is peacekeeping. Chapter 7 is peacemaking. Now, we already spoke about Chapter 7. Chapter 7 is the chapter on coercion. Coercion and use of force. For instance, when you want to institute a, 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 a sanction regime, it's Chapter 7. Everything which forces the arm of another country is coercion, is Chapter 7. Chapter 6, and as you know, we do that in Roman letters, um, figures, uh, numbers. Chapter 6 is always consensual, that is, with the agreement of the country involved. Uh, so, sorry, it's the other way around. Eh? Peacekeeping is 6, and this is 7. Peacemaking. Coercion enforcement is 7. Making. Peace enforcement. Sorry for that uh, confusion. Peacekeeping. Peacekeeping forces are always there with the consent of the country involved. So, when you read about MONUSCO, 16,000 people, the Democratic Republic of Congo, this is a peacekeeping operation with the consent of the country involved, sometimes at the demand of the country involved. What do they do? They keep the peace, the peace that has been brokered between the parties with or without an external party being the mediator. Peacemaking, peacemaking, chapter 7, Chapter 7, by the way, is also the chapter that gives you the authorization that you need to go to war you as a collection or as an individual. But peacemaking is chapter 7. And this means that the UN itself goes into a country. Not a country or a coalition of countries. The United Nations itself goes to a country to make peace. Now, this is almost not used anymore. Most of the missions now are peacekeeping Russian. An example of a peacemaking, which we also call a peace enforcement mission, may be the 1952 peacemaking operation in Korea, which was also one of the first peacemaking operations ever in the history of the United Nations. The Korea War, you remember a very tough war, then the United Nations set up a mission by itself, for which of course it asked that countries would contribute, and Belgium was one among them, to contribute to that mission. 
Uh, and that was really a fighting force that was a UN force as such. Whereas very often the rest is, there is a coalition and we give the blessings to the coalition and the coalition is, for instance, under the command of a American commander or sometimes a Belgian commander. For instance, there was a UNTAES, UNTAES, United Nations um, Transitional Administration in Eastern Slavonia, UNTAES. And that was a Belgian command, but okay, that's not very important. So that's, um, that's peacekeeping. Sometimes we talk about chapter six and a half, because even a peacekeeping operation sometimes needs to have recourse to constraint, to coercion, uh, as the circumstances have changed. You can have a peace, you send a peacekeeping operation, at once the situation worsens internally because the dynamics, the peace is not stab stable yet, then a peacekeeping operation, although in principle it may not have recourse to use of force, can do that. It can always use force for self-protection, that is the protection of the troops themselves. That's always allowed. For that you don't need a chapter uh, 7 authorization. All right, well I think time is almost over. I leave it at that. I uh, was going to say something on track to diplomacy, but we can do that uh, perhaps next week in a nutshell, uh, in case we can't come back to that. Track 2 diplomacy, I already dropped that term as well. Track 1 diplomacy is official diplomacy. It's diplomacy made by diplomats, officials, ministers and that kind of things. Track 2 diplomacy is very often diplomacy made by third parties that are willing to help you out in your problem. Such as, for instance, today, Kofi Annan does a lot of track two diplomacy. There is a problem somewhere in the world, internally, domestically, in a country, or between two neighboring countries. You feel like I'm not in a position directly to deal with you, because I simply can't stand you. But on the other hand, I kind of understand that talking would help we call Kofi Annan, he comes in, and then start mediating. You have different forms of track two diplomacy. You have mainly good offices and mediation. Good offices, and that's, I will stop there. Good offices means I'm a third party, and I just make your job easier. Either by providing facilities, such as, for instance, a place to meet, the translators, a secretariat that can draft texts and so on. Uh, I can thus facilitate and help you conciliate around a problem, a dispute that is yours, but you remain the owners of the discussion proper. That is good offices. I, the third party, I don't put my nose in the dispute which is on the table. A mediator does much more. A mediator is somebody who actively participates at the discussion. He steps in. He remains, of course, neutral and unpartisan. These are the two great requirements for any third party, whether it's good offices of mediation, neutrality and impartiality. The words are clear, impartiality, that means I don't take any party, I don't side with any party, impartiality. Neutrality means I don't have any kind of prejudice prejudgery judgment on the issue at stake. You see, the neutrality is related to the topic of the dispute. The impartiality is related to the parties to the dispute. 
I don't side with the parties. Impartiality, neutrality, I'm neutral as regards the possible solution that will emerge of this situation. Now, I go back to the mediator. The mediator, contrary to the good officer, the good officer facilitates. But that can be very important. And he can find a nice location, like, for instance, many people like to go to Switzerland, because Switzerland has that reputation of neutrality, good offices, and that kind of things. So they go there. That's the good officer. The mediator is the one who says, look, do you want to talk directly or not? They say, no. OK, I will shuttle down. That's what we call shuttle diplomacy. But then he also says, look, what you now suggest that won't fly. It's almost um, a provocation that you do for the other party. Soften it down. But I will defend your other point where you are steady in your feet. I go to the other party and I defend it. So what I do as a mediator is really come into the debate. And sometimes I can make a proposal of my own and say to the two parties, look, neither you nor he are on the right track. With this, we will never get where we need to get. Let me make a proposal. You bring it to the fore. Both parties may be surprised. They didn't expect something like that. So it's really new to the debate. And then they agree or don't agree, or you modulate and so on. All right? It's almost half. I leave it at that. Are there one or two questions? Because I know that I have to respect your time. Some of you have uh, other things to do.